Hello, Chemistry 2342. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 18. These are reactions on the alpha carbon of carbonyl compounds. So it's not on the carbonyl compound, it is on the one next to it. So right now, up to now, we've been using the carbonyl as our functionalized point where we can use the partially uh, uh, positive side of this carbonyl to act as our reaction site, and then we can attack it with nucleophiles to either give a substitution product or an addition product. This chapter, we're focusing on the carbon next to the one on the carbonyl. We're gonna call that the alpha carbon, and we're gonna call the hydrogen on there the alpha hydrogen. And so the benefit of that is if we can remove this hydrogen with the base, we'll have a negative charge adjacent to that carbonyl. So we're making this carbon the actual nucleophile in our next sets of reactions, and we're not reacting actually at the carbonyl center. Okay, so why can we remove that hydrogen from that alpha carbon, okay? If we look at the acidity of just ethane here, we can see the pKa is around 60, which makes it a very poor acid. By having the out the carbons next to the carbonyl here, we have electronic drawing groups here, which means we drop the, we increase the acidity of those protons by decreasing the pKa into the 15 to 20 range, okay? Notice that if we have a donating group like this um, OH group, uh, I'm sorry, this ester group here, we can uh, decrease the acidity of the system because it's slightly electron donated, okay? So what else helps us with this idea that we have um, the ability to remove this alpha hydrogen? One of the things we have is that once we do that, we can now, just like in an acetate ion, we can have resonance stability. We have two different resonance conformers. We can have the negative charge on the oxygen here, or we can have the negative charge on the carbon. And so we're delocalizing that negative charge across three atoms, just like in an acetate ion, so that we actually gain this resonance stabilized material, which means it helps that proton become more acidic, okay? So let's look at all the different types of alpha hydrogens we have and how, what their acidities can be. So if we look on the left side here, we have the, um, we start with the least acidic set and it's the amides. So we have our carbonyl, but we have donating by the nitrogen here. Here we don't have a full carbonyl, we have that uh, nitrile group. And then we have the ester here. All of these have pKa's about that of acetylene uh, or above, okay? So if we take away that electron drawing group and just put something that doesn't donate or withdraw here, we can get our pKa's into the 19 to 17 range. Now let's move to the other side here. On the other side here, now we have two different electronic drawing groups. So we're electronic drawing from both sides. Now in the case of the first one, we have an ester on both sides here, which gives us our, P, our uh, pKa of 13.3. Now if we remove that, so we're kind of starting to look more like this side here, we drop it to 11. Now, if we have a ketone on one side and an ester on the other, we can drop it to around 10. Now, if we have two ketones on either side, we drop that to nine. So the more electronic drawing we have next to those alpha carbons, the more acidic those hydrogens become. And the more acidic those hydrogen become, the more reactive they become. So while we can still do reactions on the systems over here, we get to get very specific and much weaker bases we can use on this side. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about when we look at these types of reaction is that we have two different forms that this can be in, and we call these tautomers, okay? So the first tautomer, which should be the most stable tautomer here, is the keto. So 
you can think about that as being the ketone version of the tautomer. So we have the ketone, which is more stable, and then we have our alpha proton that can be removed from our base. When that base removes that alpha proton, we end up with the compound here known as our enolate, right? So we have our anion destabilized over, I mean, stabilized over these three carbons, and therefore that's our enolate, and that's typically our active species. If we protonate here, we go back to our ketone version. If we protonate the oxygen, we go to our alcohol with our alkene or our enol. So we call that the enol tautomer. Okay. So these are constitutional isomers and are easily in interconverted by going through this enolate ion. And then depending on which side gets protonated, it can go back and forth between these two systems. So we can easily convert from ketone to the enol back and forth in these systems. Usually it's more stable when we have the ketone because the carbon double bond is more is stronger than the carbon carbon double bond. The carbon oxygen double bond is stronger than the carbon carbon double bond. But we can influence it to be on either side based on electronics. Okay, so let's look at that mechanism here. We can do it either by acid or by base to create this back and forth reaction between the two different versions, the enol and the keto tautomers, okay? But we're going through a, the same enolate ion here, okay? So if we start with the ketone on this side here, which typically would be considered most stable, and we protonate it with an acid, we will get to this protonated species here, once this is protonated, our, our water here becomes our base and can deprotonate this side here, giving us our enol derivative here, plus regenerating our acid. Now, of course, once we have the enol, we can go back by just protonating uh, this side to get back to the system. So these are, these are reversible steps going back and forth, okay? So we can also do this tautomerization with base. And in base, it's slightly different. What we get is the removal of this alpha proton first to go through that enolate ion. And then when we have this, the enolate can now act as the base and remove uh, the acidic proton from the water here to give us our enol compound. Notice that I call the enol compound achiral right here. What that means is even if we have chirality, on our ketone system. Once it goes through this uh, hybridization change and going to the enol, we lose our chirality here. So no matter what stereochemistry we started with in our ketone, we're gonna lose it by going back and forth, back and forth through these different steps here. So all of these reactions end up with getting racemization. Okay, so we actually have some really interesting stabilities with that enol conformer. For example, uh, if we have just acetone, acetone likes to be about over 99% of it is going to be in the ketone form, but there is still a measurable amount of the enol form in that system. <coughs> this is most common for most ketone systems. However, if you have a diketone system, specifically a beta a uh, dicarbonyl system, so this are, is our alpha carbon, that makes this our beta carbon. We can actually, in the protonated form, form a six-membered ring. We're gonna use this six-membered hydrogen bonded ring again, so keep this in mind. This hydrogen bonded ring here helps stabilizes it, so it actually is more than 75% uh, in this enol conformer, okay? so. Let's think about this in the presence of uh, something like a phenol. In the phenol, this is technically the enol conformer because we have the OH here in conjugation with the double bond. If we were to break that and look at this so that we are in the keto form and move this hydrogen over into this position here, um, we would have the keto form, which in theory is the more stable form based on this. However, the fact that we can aromatize the ring by going into the enol form means that the enol form is more stable. So there are two ways we can get to have the enol tautomer more stable than the keto tautomer. 
first is a six-membered hydrogen bonded ring. The second is to have aromaticity. Okay, so let's start using this and finding another way to make this enol and keto. Instead of just deprotonating a carbonyl, we can actually add water across an alkyne. Okay, this is typically done with uh, an acid catalyst where we can add that across here to give us uh, a hydrogen on one side and OH on the other. So we would end up with the enol form here or it can rearrange to give us the keto form. If we have a symmetrical internal alkyne, we'll end up with a symmetrical ketone as our primary product because we don't have that formation of that six-membered hydrogen bonded ring. If we have an unsymmetrical internal alkyne, we'll end up with it, the ketone being in two different locations. Notice whether the ketone ends up here or here, it turns out being the same product. Here, if we have the ketone form, we'll have a methyl ketone. If we have it form in the second position here, we'll have an ethyl ketone. So we end up with a methyl ketone as one isomer and an ethyl ketone as the other isomer. Now, we can do it with terminal kinds. However, they tend to be less reactive in this step. So we typically have to use an acid catalyst plus mercury to create this uh, material. And because the enol form right here, we're gonna typically add the carbon to this internal um, carbon here. We'll end up with a methyl ketone and an enol form with the ketone being more stable. If we added it across the other side, we end up with an aldehyde. It doesn't typically happen. Therefore, we typically end up with the ketone as the derivative. Okay. All right, so once we have the enol here, we, which is our material that has the protonated alcohol, we can actually remove this proton from the alcohol and create the salt. The salt is called the enolate, okay? In reactions with acids and bases, we can generate that enol or the enolate differently. So in acid, it generally involves using the enol intermediate as the common one so that we can deprotonate it. In reactions done in base, it typically involves the enolate reaction because we deprotonated that alcohol. So in protic solvents, we'll have this as our major salt as in our acidic solvents, we're gonna have, this as our major isomer. In basic, we're gonna have the ion as our major reactant. Okay, so let's talk about our enol reactivities here, okay? Enols are electron rich, okay? So they react with electrophiles, okay? So basically it is the nucleophile, okay? Enols are more electron rich than alkenes because the alcohol donates uh, electron uh, density by resonance. Therefore, the resonance structures can be drawn that places the negative charge on either the carbon, making the carbon the nucleophile, or the oxygen, making it the more stable compound. Okay? The nucleophilic carbon can react with an electrophile to form this new bond. So in the case of having it react with the electrophile, typically this bond formed here gives us an irreversible reaction, and we end up going to products here. Notice this is a reversible reaction. Once we form the attack as the nucleophile to get here, these are non-reversible reactions and we end up forming a new carbon carbon bond. However, if the oxygen reacts here, it tends to form a reversible bond and can go back to the enol enolate structure. Okay, so now let's look at the enolate reactivity. So this is the reactivity of the anion itself, okay? So enolates are formed when a base removes a proton from the carbon of the alpha carbon, okay? So what this gives us is our alpha carbon starts here, we remove our base, and it gives us our enolate. Enolate is our negatively charged species right here, okay? And it's resonance stabilized to have the charge balance between having the negative charge on the carbon and the negative charge on the oxygen. So these will go back and forth, back and forth until it reacts as a nucleophile on a substrate. Okay, so because the fact that we can have that anion on two places, we actually have two reactive sites, okay? 
It can react on the carbon site, and that tends to be an irreversible bond, or we can react on the oxygen site, and this tends to be a reversible bond, so it ends up going back to the enolate form until we get to this new preferred irreversible pathway. <clears throat> Since enolates usually react on that carbon, the resonance structure replaces the negative charge on oxygen, and then it tends to act as the uh, new keto form. Okay, so base strength affects how the, base, the equilibrium forms and which form of the enol keto you create. So if you have a weak base like alkoxide here, because the acidity of this proton it has a pKa of, of 19 and ethanol has a pKa of 16, we actually can form the enolate ion here, but it's strongly shifted to the starting material side. Okay? It still forms and we can still use it as a nucleophile, but it's important to note that this is an in equilibrium and shifted primarily to the non-enolate side. However, if we use a much stronger base like a hydride or a non-nucleophilic dialkyl amide, we end up with something that forms an irreversible direction to form the enolate ion because our ketone, again, has that acidity of, that, of uh, 19, but our amine has a pKa of 38 which means it's the much weaker acid, so it's actually irreversibly shifted to form the enolate ion. The enolate ion is formed, and then it can react as the nucleophile. Okay, so if this is in equilibrium with a weaker uh, base, and this is not in equilibrium with a stronger base, how does that affect our uh, reaction mechanism? Okay, well, the way it affects our reactive mechanism is it allows us to form different forms. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the irreversible nature of the enolate right here. When we form uh, this very, very strong base, one of the common ones we use is called lithium diisopropyl amide, okay? What that means is we take the diisopropyl amine here and we use a lithium reagent like butyl lithium to remove the hydrogen. When it removes the hydrogen, Remember, the carbon here has a negative charge, so it's the nucleophile. It removes that hydrogen, and then this, it forms butane, which typically boils out of the reaction and becomes non-reactive. And we end up with this lithium salt here. So we call that lithium salt LDA. It's a very, very strong base, but like T-butoxide, it is non-nucleophilic. It's so big and bulky, it cannot act as a nucleophile, okay? so. We typically make this right before the reaction uh, because it's not incredibly stable. Okay, so now if we have an irreversible and a reversible way to make these enolates, that means we can actually control the reaction to form the kinetic version or the thermodynamic version. So in the kinetic version, we are going to remove the least sterically hindered base, least sterically hindered uh, alpha hydrogen, okay? So that means if we do that at low temperatures and with a very strong irreversible base like LDA, we will get to form the least substituted side is where we're gonna form our anion. And if our least substituted side is where our anion is formed, that means that we will have our least substituted side reacting as the nucleophile. And therefore, in this case, we would end up with the uh, kinetic product being the, having the least substituted material. Notice that the reason we call that the thermodynamic product is because the intermediate here is a double bond, right? So in this double bond intermediate, remember that the more substituted the double bond is, the more thermodynamically stable it is. So in this case here, we're forming a di-substituted double bond. And in this case here, we're forming a tri-substituted or tetra-substituted double bond. So the idea here is that this is not thermodynamically favored. This uh, this one is not thermodynamically favored, 
but this one is because it's the more substitutive double bond. So because it's irreversible, because it's big and bulky, it's going to take the less sterically demanding hydrogen, and that therefore it gives us this product. If we use a weaker base in a protic solvent, for example, ethanol with ethoxide, we are actually going to have the enolate form that is more stable, and therefore we're going to get the thermodynamic product. So we can control which side of a ketone will react based on which reagent we use. If we want the less substituted kinetic product, we need to use low temperatures and a non-reversible base. If we want to use the more substituted, we have to use a protic solvent with a weaker base. And that is the end of section 18.1.